Thank you, Philip, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we are in Luke 7. This is our last look at Luke's gospel in this uh, series that we've been in in these early chapters of Luke. Uh, next Sunday, um, we start a short little series in the lead up to Christmas in the book of Isaiah, and we have... Um, uh, Gus and Sarah Cameron with us. Uh, the Camerons are mission partners with us serving in Fairfield and they'll be with us to share about that work but also Gus will be preaching as we, we start that series together next week. But for now, uh, Luke chapter 7, page 886 in the Church Bibles and I'm going to pray for us as we look at it together. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he has come to deliver your favour, favour that we don't deserve and yet favour that you freely offer. We pray, Father, that we would see him, see this favour and respond with wholehearted faith. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one of the aspects of my job uh, that I never anticipated when I chose to serve in full-time Christian ministry was the amount of forms that I would have to sign. Uh, not necessarily forms to become a minister, although there were uh, plenty of those, but forms signed on behalf of others. Uh, I am a sitting target for those sort of forms, you name it. School references, passport applications, statutory declarations, whatever it is, I am a, a, apparently a reputable witness for, for such a form. Uh, anyone that needs a witness, uh, here I am advertising my wares, please don't come to me with your forms. Um, uh, one of the accepted categories on the said forms is Minister of Religion. That's me, Minister of Religion. And I remember once asking someone in the public service, why is it that my signature is deemed reputable, whereas other obviously more reputable people that I know, their signature doesn't work? Why, why does mine work? The answer that came back was intriguing. It's because you're a person of faith. Uh, isn't that interesting? Uh, I think it's an answer that opens up more questions than it actually answers for us, because I imagine as we gather here as a church this morning, uh, many, if not most of us, would regard ourselves as a per people of faith. Uh, I am a person of faith. And even if you're someone here uh, still working out what you make of the claims of Jesus, uh, you may say of yourself, I'm interested in the things of faith. I, I'm a person of faith in that sense. I'm, I'm interested, curious uh, about the things of faith. The problem we have is, whether we regard ourselves as a person of faith or interested or whatever our situation may be, is it's hard to know what we mean when we say faith. What does it mean to be a person of faith? What is faith? Faith seems to be all sorts of different things in our culture. There, there's phrases like this, I wish I had your faith. Uh, which sort of faith is almost this thing that some people have and it's out of reach of, of others. Uh, and then there's the, I'm taking a leap of faith, which paints a picture of faith as, well, blind guess about the future. There's that picture of faith. Or there's, uh, in some Christian circles, there's faith that equals no doubts, no dark nights of the soul, no failure. No, the more faith you have, the better your life is. There's that sort of faith. Uh, and then there would be some who would say of faith, it's a personal matter, it's a private matter. I don't talk about that with other people. That's between me and God. And then there might be people who look at people of faith and say, well, that's naive. That's wishful thinking. That's no more than like, a, if you like, a cardboard shield against the, the, the troubles in this world. So what is faith with all these different ideas about it? And that's an important question because the Bible says again and again that the way to be right with the living God, the way to be in a right relationship with him is to respond to him in faith. We're justified by faith alone, we're told in the Bible. Uh, so what is faith? Well, Luke 7 is so helpful because it's going to clarify that question for us. It's going to give us the answer and not our answer, but Jesus' answer. If you look at verse 9, as we hear this story of the centurion, he will say of him, that's faith. That's what it looks like. Uh, so we can be clear. Faith, great faith, as Jesus calls it in verse 9, seems to have two key aspects. And they're captured in the two statements of this centurion. Uh, here are the statements. Verse 6, he says this, I'm not worthy. And then the next verse, verse 7, his other statement, just say the word, Jesus. And so if you were to sum up what great faith is in Jesus' estimation, and he's really the judge of such things, here it is, approaching Jesus empty-handed, but humbly expectant. Approaching Jesus empty-handed, but humbly expectant. Now, if you're planning to go to sleep, that's the sentence to remember. That's what this passage is all about. But let's have a look together. 
And as we do, remember the context of Luke's gospel up to this point. Remember what we've seen. Remember Luke 4, Jesus has said, I've come to announce God's favour. I've come to share that favour with the world, with anybody who would seek that favour. And what we've seen in chapters 4 to 6 is a whole series of days of that favour being proclaimed, that favour being delivered, and people claiming their share of it uh, by faith. That's what we've seen. Now, Luke 7 is another day like that, but it's the day we get clarity on what faith, what sort of faith enables us to claim our share of God's favour. And we're going to see it through the healing of the servant of this centurion that we read about. But what's interesting is the focus isn't on the miracle, as spectacular as that is. We're told in a very matter-of-fact way in verse 10, oh, and by the way, the servant was healed. But the focus is on the centurion's faith. So what is it about this man's faith that causes Jesus to be amazed, we're told, verse 9? Two things from that sentence. Here's the first. Uh, He's amazed that this man approaches him empty-handed. It's captured in those words by the centurion, verse 6, I am not worthy, Jesus. Uh, The words actually spoken by a second delegation that this centurion sends to Jesus. He sends two groups of people to plead for favour on his servant's behalf, on his behalf. Uh, And uh, we know three things about this centurion from the verses. Uh, Here's the first. Have a look at verse 2. He's a man in need. Uh, If you were to meet a centurion in in Roman culture, he is not by, on face value, a man in need. He is a man in control. He is a man in charge. He is a man who is secure. He's all of these things. But he's presented here simply as a man in need. His servant, verse 2, is sick and about to die. He has no answer to that problem. Like us, even with all the resources he has at his command, he has no answer to the problem of death. He's a man in need. Second thing to notice about him, verse 3, and you see this in the first delegation he sends, he's a man on the outside. Uh, Do you see, uh, he's a Roman soldier. He's a Gentile. He's not one of God's people. He's not a Jew. And so he thinks this favour is for God's people, so I'm going to have to send a Jewish delegation to plead for it on my behalf. He, by himself, has no access, he thinks, to this favour. Like us, here in the nations, he's one described in the book of Ephesians as without God and without hope in the world. He's a man in need, he's a man on the outside, but, verse 3 again, he's a man who's heard about Jesus. Uh, We're told he's heard what Jesus is doing. He's heard him proclaiming this favour in all the towns. He's heard him delivering this favour, a year open to outsiders like him. And so this outsider sends a delegation of insiders to plead for that favour. Uh, As I said, he actually sends two delegations, and that's intriguing, but really helpful, because they're going to provide a contrast for us. This first delegation we're about to see is going to show us what empty-handed faith doesn't look like. Uh, And then the second delegation are going to show us what it does look like. And, And I suspect as we look at them, we're going to see that both of those things can reside in our own hearts. So let's look at the first one, verse 3 and 4, this first delegation showing us what empty-handed faith doesn't look like. Uh, Here's their approach. They pleaded earnestly with Jesus, verse 4, this man deserves to have you do this. Uh, There is the antithesis of empty-handed faith, empty-handed approach to Jesus. Jesus, this man that we're representing, he's worthy of your help. He's worthy of you being favourable towards him. Three aspects of his worthiness are cited for us. And as we look at them, I suspect we're tempted to, well, sometimes view ourselves before God the same way. Here's the first aspect of his worthiness, and it's really by implication. Verse 2, he's a good man. Uh, The evidence? Well, his treatment of his slave. That, That is remarkable in this culture. In this culture, uh, uh, slaves in Roman culture, they were disposable. They had no rights. In fact, you read the history of this time, it's actually the gospel that turned that upside down and gave such people rights. But at this point, here is a man who, we're told, values the life of his servant highly. That's remarkable. He is a good man, an unusually good man. And I think we too may be tempted to think God can be approached from that same claim. I'm worthy for God to look favourably on me because I'm good. Now, we might not want to say that out uh, just bluntly like that, so maybe we'll go with this, I'm good enough. 
uh, one of the things that I've noticed over many years in, in gospel ministry is if I'm meeting with a family preparing for the funeral of a loved one, and if I ask them, the, the obvious question to ask is, tell me about your loved one. And they'll list all sorts of things about them, wonderful things, memories that they have of them. But what is universally cited is that they are a good person. He was a good man. She was a good woman. Uh, and I suspect we do this in part because we hope that the good deeds that we can cite of ourselves and those we love will make us worthy of God's favour. It reminds me of a movie a number of years ago. It wasn't a great movie, to be honest, but um, most of my movie illustrations are not great movies. <laughs> but here it is. It's called Meet Joe Black. Has anyone seen Meet Joe Black? It's got one great actor in it and one terrible actor. I'll leave you to decide. Um, and in this, in this movie... Um, uh, Brad Pitt, I'm not saying which one he is, um, uh, he plays a character called Joe Black and uh, he's not got a great role to be honest. His role in this movie is to visit Earth to let people know that their time is up, to let people know that they're about to pass away. And so he has the job of telling Anthony Hopkins' uh, character, who's a uh, hugely successful and influential businessman that the time has come for him and he gives him time to sort out his business affairs and to sort out things in his family but right near the end of the movie is is this scene here and they literally walk across a bridge to sort of metaphorically say this is the moment and just before they they cross the bridge Anthony Hopkins says to Joe Black he says um, about to meet his maker he says should I be afraid and there's a pause and the response, not a man like you. And I reckon that's the logic of our world. We are good enough. We need not fear. Uh, that's what they cite about this man. Two other things about his worthiness are cited, and they're really specific good deeds. Have a look at verse 5. He's worthy because he loves God's people. Uh, and again, I think there is it is possible to feel confident to approach God because of our, if you like, our association with God's people and the things of God. We might not want to say of ourselves, um, Jesus is my king. I follow Jesus. I, he is the one in charge of my life. I, I heed his voice. I obey him. We might not want to say that. I'm not a born again Christian, but I, I like church. I like Christians. And again, uh, often visiting people in the lead up to a funeral, if I ask the question, tell me about their faith, were they a person of faith? What is usually cited is attendance. Uh, they'll speak of the fact that they were associated uh, with a church. Uh, he was a member of Wurunga Anglican for years. Uh, he went to the youth group as a kid. He was baptized as an Anglican. He's worthy. Uh, here's the final uh, aspect of his worthiness cited by this first delegation. He's worthy, and this is the crudest line on his CV, he's worthy because he built the synagogue. He's paid his way, Jesus. He, he's in credit with you. Uh, you. You owe him. It's the sort of idea of worthiness that I think makes it dangerous for churches to seek uh, financial support from the community around us because it, it perpetuates a myth that giving is meritorious before God. The delegation says to Jesus, this man deserves this. You owe him. He, he's paid his way big time. He built the whole synagogue. And I think we as believers are not immune to that sort of thinking, maybe not financially, but in terms of our uh, credit before God. Uh, I suspect sometimes we can think this way. When I first became a Christian, I was obviously a debtor. There was more in the sin column than the good deeds column. But, you know, over time, I'm kind of paying my way. It's at least break even at this point. But the measurements we use to speak of our faith often are human effort measurements. I'm doing this. These are my activities. This is what I have to show in the credit column. And I think you see it in a, in a, a different way when troubles come our way as Christians and we can find ourselves asking, what have I done to deserve this? Uh, the mirror to that question is this. I deserve better than this. I'm in credit. That's the first delegation's approach to Jesus. This man is worthy, Jesus. You owe him this. But it is an approach simply that does not fit with the favour that Jesus has come to proclaim. Uh, we've seen this all along. He's not come for the worthy. He's come for the unworthy. The truth is that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ shatters our sense of self-worthiness before God. Uh, uh, these famous verses in, in Romans 3, um, this sums us all up. It says... There is no one righteous, 
Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become, do you see, they're worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. All of us approach God from a position of unworthiness. Each of us are debtors, actually, with, with no way back. We're, we're like the prodigal son later in Luke's gospel. You remember as he's approaching his father's house, what's in his heart, what's on his lips? I am no longer worthy. And here's a way of testing, I think, whether we are grasping that for ourselves as Christians, whether we are understanding why Jesus had to come and die in our place. Uh, we're grasping it if the longer we're Christians, the, the cross actually gets bigger in our estimation, not smaller, our need of it. Because what will happen is our understanding of God's worthiness, his holiness, his glory keeps getting bigger and bigger the more we get to know him. And at the same time, our understanding of the depths of our sin and our desperate need of rescue gets bigger. The cross just gets bigger over time. We don't grow more worthy over time. We grow more thankful. In Jesus' estimation, genuine faith, that is empty-handed faith, has an altogether different vocabulary than this first delegation. And so let's look at the second delegation, verse 6. And here's a question worth asking. Why does he send a second delegation? I mean, it was working. Jesus has heard the first delegation. He's on his way. He's coming to rescue the servant. Job done. Why send a second delegation? Could it be that as, as these Jewish elders come back to the man and say, we did a great job selling you, you, you looked brilliant, and he really bought it, and he's on his way, did, they, did the centurion start to think, maybe they've overcooked the egg a little bit in terms of my worthiness, and his CV was somewhat embellished? Uh, reminds me of my first CV um, while I was at uni, while I was applying for jobs coming out of uni. I worked during uni at Willoughby Squash and Workout. Uh, I've never played a game of squash, but I played there, uh, worked there for a number of years. A simple job, book courts for people. I once double booked the world champion. That was a bad day. Um, uh, sell drinks, and sometimes if I was doing the early morning shift, cook toast for those uh, uh, playing squash. And so as I'm putting this CV together near the end of uni, each of these things got just a little bit of a polish put on it. So booking courts became event management. <laughs> Uh, and making toast became catering. Uh, all you'd need to do is scratch below the surface, and it was pretty hollow, those claims. And that's what this, this centurion fears. And so as Jesus is not far from his house, the, the fear grows, have, have we overdone it here? And so he sends a second delegation, verse 6, with a true assessment of himself. Lord, don't trouble yourself. For I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to, to have you come to me, Jesus. Uh, he is clear-sighted faith at last. Uh, seeing Jesus for who he is. It's just like Simon in the boat. You remember that? As Simon saw Jesus for who he is. I'm not worthy. Here is the way we're supposed to measure our worthiness. Not against ourselves or even against others, but against a true measure of worth. The Holy Son of God, the Lord Jesus the one before whom the book of Revelation says, and we sang this earlier, there will come a day when the, all of creation will sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy is he. Clear-sighted faith is not some claim, vain claim of worth. It's a humble confession of our unworthiness before this awesome God. And here for me is another obstacle of great faith, genuine faith, because I think very easily as Christians, we lose sight of our awe of Jesus. Uh, we domesticate him, we, we make him pocket size and we put him in our pocket and he walks around in our giant life as we do our giant things. It's the other way around. Authentic faith starts with awe, I'm not worthy. You are awesome and holy and good and I am a sinful man, Lord. CV, it's not a CV, it's a rap sheet. Have we lost this as Christians? This mindset that actually in the, the early Anglican uh, prayer book writers in the Book of Common Prayer, they start uh, a Book of Common Prayer service with these words. Uh, see if you can see any claims to worthiness in it. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. The burden of them is intolerable. <laughs> if I won't echo in my heart, I'm not worthy. I won't fully trust Jesus. I won't need to because I'm trusting myself. But the centurion says, Jesus, I've got nothing. I'm unworthy, but I'm asking for favour. 
Now, just as we finish, we need to see the other aspect of great faith. Great faith is not just having our self-worth shattered before our God, but replacing that with complete and wholehearted confidence in God and his authority and the authority of his word, particularly. Do you see it there, verse 7? Just say the word, Jesus, and my servant will be healed. What's amazing about this faith is not the request of a miracle. Jesus has heard all that before. It's the confidence this man has in the authority of Jesus' word. The centurion is confident that Jesus can speak a word with authority over even death. And he gets authority. Do you see it there in verse 8? He knows how chains of command work. He's a, he's a centurion. There's a hundred men below him that he says, go and they go, come and they come. There, he knows how it works. And, and there's people over him too. There's a limit to his authority. There's the tribune over him. And then, of course, well, the emperor when they speak, he obeys. But he knows that on this day, there is no word strong enough to deal with the enemy that has come against his servant. Here is an authority that both the servant and the centurion and the tribune and the emperor have no word for, death. And they're not alone. It is the same for us. 1 Corinthians 15 calls death our last great enemy. But the centurion goes to Jesus in the face of this enemy and he is supremely confident that Jesus has the authority to command even death to stand down. This is clear-sighted faith. In the face of this mighty enemy, Jesus, just say the word. And he does. Death, stand down. And with that word of authority, death surrenders. And if you want to know why as a church... Hearing the word of our God is right at the heart of all we do when we gather like it is this morning. Here's why. We are confident by faith that this word has authority over life and death. If he speaks the final word over death, and we see this here, he speaks the final word over all of life. True faith is seeing that Jesus' word rules all of life. I wonder if that's how you view Jesus. He's proven his trustworthiness and his authority in his word that is powerfully committed to your good where it matters most your death do you trust him with all of life is that how you view him do you say to him just say the word when it comes to all matters of salvation and life the word of jesus is actually the final word on the matter and i reckon we squirm at that thought in 2023 it's not how we like things we like dialogue we like compromise. We like mixed opinions blended together. But no, he's the one, the only one who can walk into this room and end the speculation on any matter. His word is powerfully committed to our good. His word is the final word on all issues of life, sexuality, money, work, ethics, justice, you name it. True faith is to say, Jesus, just say the word. We trust it's a good word and we know it's an authoritative word. And so do you see how the passage finishes? Verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I, I, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Jesus hears his man's faith. I'm not worthy. Just say the word. And he says, ah, look, do you see it? That's faith. That's what it looks like. Approaching him empty-handed, but humbly expectant. Somehow God's people, Israel, uh, have lost the simplicity of that. Somehow they grew increasingly confident in themselves and not in their God and increasingly unsure about God's word. And their drift is a warning to us. But this centurion is a callback to the real deal, to be people of faith. I wonder before I pray for us whether you've ever seen a person of faith up close, not the, not the people who sign the forms, but a real person of faith like this centurion. I imagine many of us have come across the first sort of delegation type of faith, uh, confident in our own worthiness. In fact, we probably see it in our own hearts all too often. But have you seen faith like this centurion? Uh, I reckon I have. I've seen it again and again, uh, even in this church family. But just as we finish, I want to share with you one example. His name is Bruce. And uh, I met him in the very first church I served in out, out of college in, in Kellyville. And uh, he, at the time, he was serving as the, the head of our welcoming team, and he was brilliant at it. Um, 
uh, joyful, gifted, just loved people and connecting them with other people. And he's in heaven now, and I suspect he's on the welcoming team uh, there in heaven. Uh, and I had the joy of uh, meeting him uh, near the end of his life, and he'd been a successful and influential businessman in his time. He was retired by the time I met him. But over the years, Jesus and the word of Jesus had emptied this man of pride. Uh, he'd become not Bruce the businessman, but Bruce the recipient of God's favour. I had the joy of seeing, if you like, that great renovation project near the end of its earthly stage. Uh, and I remember speaking to his wife, Alwyn, at different points during the time we were there, and, and she would retell the story of just how much renovation had been required, uh, how much pride had, had gone. What I saw was the miracle of a man walking humbly to the sound of his master's voice, learning to say to Jesus, just say the word, trusting Jesus with all of his life. And as he did, all of that life got reordered. Finally, a few years ago, I got the news that the time had come for Bruce to trust Jesus with his death. Uh, and yet when he bowed the knee before death, as we all must do, his king, whom he trusted, simply said no. And as we read later in Luke's gospel, Luke 7, young man, wake up. That's a person of faith. Uh, my friend Bruce, this centurion, and my prayer for my own life and your life and the life of our church family is that Jesus would do this for us, that he would fill us again with awe before him, that he would break as many times as he needs to our stubborn, prideful necks so that we can receive his favour empty-handed, that we would walk humbly before the sound of his voice, even, yes, through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the Lord Jesus, our King, the one who is worthy. Uh, we pray, Father, that before him that we would approach with nothing in our hands, that we would see him for who he is, that we would claim this favour by faith alone. In Jesus' name, amen.